Hello everyone again. Thanks for, um, for having me in this conference. I'd like to specifically thank Jeremy and Charlotte. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen to talk about the connections of Iron Maiden with Japan and more specifically the uh, samurai culture. Can you see the screen, folks? Okay. Um, maybe some of you know, well, Jeremy mentioned that. I've, I've been researching the work of Iron Maiden for quite a long time now. And as a result, I published back in 2018 the book that Jeremy mentioned, Iron Maiden, A Journey Through History. Um, so I've been interested in their work for a long time. Um, and uh, in this specific talk, uh, as I said, I'm going to focus on the relationship they uh, or the representations, as, as Larry mentioned, how they try to represent the Japanese culture um, to the interest of the heavy metal culture. I mean, what kind, how do they slice the, the, the multifarious Japanese culture into the heavy metal ethos? Um, so let's, let's go. Um, my objective is to investigate how the Japanese culture and specifically the samurai culture uh, is depicted in Iron Maiden's work. And my guiding question is, how was the samurai culture depicted and how stereotyped is it, if so, when confronted with the Japanese historiography, even though we know that we're talking about representation. So by no means I'm trying to censor or question when things do not um, overlap. I mean, that is, of course, we're talking about works of art here. So um, in, the, in the territory of creation, of course, you have um, uh, a mar several margins to explore, and that's, that's exactly what they do. So in terms of methodology, um, I, I read books and articles, made some musical analysis and image, uh, image analysis, right? Um, well, because of, of the time limitations, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, to focus on what really interests. But I think it's important to mention that uh, because this is a pre-modernity uh, event, I think it's important to, to, point, uh, to point out that the Japanese history is divided into different periods when compared with uh, the Western history. So Japan was a feudal society until 1868 when the Meiji period comes in. So uh, I'll be discussing both um, uh, very and very briefly the Senjutsu, uh, Iron Maiden Senjutsu, which is a, uh, we, we might locate that in the Kamakura period and the samurai Miyamoto, Miyamoto Musashi, um, who is from the late 16th uh, century. So, uh, but in any case, they were not in the uh, uh, modern period. So these are the historical periods in Japan. And uh, for our purposes here, Senjutsu would be located in the Kamakura period, 1192-1333. And Mus uh, Miyamoto Musashi, uh, the famous samurai, who is the character of Sun and Steel, would be in the transition of the Azuchi Momoyama period and the Edo period, which goes on for more than 250 years. So just a brief, brief explanation in terms of uh, the periods. Um, to answer these questions, I will take into account the artwork here, we're focusing on Made in Japan, that was the first album when Iron Maiden made reference to the Japanese culture and the Senjutsu cover. I'm going to um, anticipate some comments that I was going to leave for the end of the presentation, but uh, we can uh, immediately compare the two covers. The first one is from 1981, and Eddie, the mascot, is wearing um, a, a Western outfit with jeans and a T-shirt, and he hold, he's holding the katana, the, the long Japanese sword of the samurai, um, and he is on a stage. So he's, he's very much a visitor to the Japanese uh, atmosphere, whereas in Senjutsu, he has uh, morphed into this much more menacing uh, uh, Kamakura period samurai, uh, complete with the suit of armor, and uh, maybe not on the cover, but in the in in the booklet artwork, um, you can see the um, uh, uh, J Japanese at uh, Japanese architecture in the background. 
the songs that uh, I investigated were Sun and Steel from the Peace of Mind album in 93, in 83 and Senjutsu that lends its title to, to, to the album. So first of all, Made in Japan 1981, we have, um, as I said, Eddie on a stage, not, not particularly in Japan, it could be anywhere. Um, and as I said, he's a visitor. He's not sporting uh, Japanese clothes or anything, just uh, showing that he's um, open to incorporating some characteristics of this new culture. And this is very symbolic because it has to do with the touring bands that toured Japan, starting with the Beatles in the 1960s and several other rock bands toured Japan. So it, it, it shows this kind of interaction that they were <clears throat> eager to establish. Um, there is nothing specially Japanese in, uh, made in Japan, so it's, it's, it's pretty much just a reference in terms of the artwork. Um, and all that is left are some promotional pics of their visit to Japan back in 81. We're still with Paul Diano and, and Clive Burr. Um, so, as I said, nothing specifically Japanese. Then we move on to Sun and Steel, that's a track on Peace of Mind. And now we have a much more uh, uh, specific, specifically written thing on the Japanese culture, which is the song Sun and Steel. Despite the identical title to Mishima's book, it has nothing to do with that book. Um, and in fact, it's a biographical song about Musashi, Miyamoto Musashi who was the greatest samurai that ever lived, considered by many, mastered the two-sword technique. And uh, according to his biographer, William Scott Wilson, he became an, a legend and an ideal to the Japanese people with no equivalent in the Western culture. Uh, he was raised by an uncle, Dorinbo. At, at his first duel, age 13, he killed his opponent, Arima Kihei, and this is mentioned in the song. At 16, he left his uncle home to become a ronin, that is, he, he uh, wandered from province to province, challenging opponents to prove his technique. Uh, he didn't follow any specific schools. He didn't mind what his opponent's weapons were. So confident was he in his own skills, he ignored tradition. So uh, uh, to the desperation of, of the Orthodox samurais, and he fought with makeshift, makeshift wooden swords on many occasions. He won 60 jewels from uh, 13 to 29, and the last one against Sasaki Koshiro is his most famous one. This is one image from the many, many films about Musashi that you can find on the internet. Um, and curiously, after that, he devoted, uh, he, he stopped fighting at 29 or 30, and then he devoted himself to arts like the Sumi painting, the tea ceremony, gardening, the no theater, and poetry. Here are some examples of his paintings, but again, this would not be so interesting for the interesting for the ethos of heavy metal, portraying him as someone who went to the tea ceremony, right? So of course, um, they they lock lock in on uh, the Musashi who who killed his first man at thirteen, killer instinct, instinct, animal supreme. That's what's interesting in the heavy metal uh, universe. And in his uh, last years, he devoted himself to the writing of the Book of Five Rings, which is a kind of treatise of swordsmanship, strategy, and philosophy. Uh, which, by the way, is, uh, some of it, it's mentioned in the song. Um, and he died at sixty-one, probably from stomach cancer, not at a duel. Um, right. This, so, and and he entered popular culture in a number of ways, uh, uh, especially through uh, the famous Japanese writer, A.J. Yoshikawa. He wrote this very, very long trilogy of Musashi. It's part biograph biographical, part fiction. Um, but uh, uh, Musashi made his way to popular culture through uh, Yo uh, Yoshikawa's books and also several and several uh, filmic adaptations of his life and even mangas like the series Vagabond. Um, the song follows um, pretty closely Musashi's life. You killed your first man at 13, uh, Killer Instant, Animal Supreme. 
by 16 he had learned to fight the way of the old, the warrior that the bushy doll you took it as you write and then there are some uh poetic licenses there when he says sunlight falling on your steel knowing that he privileged wooden swords even though he he fought with two swords but death in life is your ideal is also something that is more created than biographical really because uh the duels of course one of the opponents ended up dying uh, in most occasions but it, it was more about uh confronting techniques rather than a, 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 a killer instinct or something like that it was much more about tech to prove your technique um and in the end uh, at the end of the song, Steve Harris says, through earth and water, fire and wind, these are the names of four of the five uh, chapters in the book of uh, the five rings. Um, and at the end, he mentions the cut by fire and stones. This is one of the movements that Musashi mentions in his book. Well, I'm really running out of time here. It's really quick. So I'll just forward to talk about, very briefly to talk about Senjutsu. So as I said, um, here, you, you might have the impression that they wanted to create a concept album on the Japanese samurai culture, but it's not quite what happens when you listen to the songs. They're not really interrelated in order to, to make it a concept album, but that is, uh, uh, there is uh, this coherence between the artwork and the, and the title track, Senjutsu. Um, as Lady mentioned before, I'm showing you again Power Slave and also the Book of Souls, which which is uh, makes reference to the Maya culture. So once again, they they resort to an ancient civilization to draw inspiration. Um, and the the title track, which loosely translates as strategy or tactics, um, and because of Eddie's art uh, uh, suit of armor. Uh, we can connect the lyrics to the attempted invasions of Japan by the Mongols. Um, anyway, I'm going to forward some slides here, but this was in the time of Kublai Khan, um, who, by the way, was the grandson of Genghis Khan. Um, and uh, I think I put some maps here. Yes, the Mongol Empire. So it was the, the, the biggest empire that ever existed, existed, bigger than Alexander's, bigger than the Roman Empire. So it was really huge. And on two occasions, the Mongols tried to invade Japan um, in 1274 and 1281. And uh, in the city of Hakata that you can see here in the, uh, in the smaller island here, uh, they built a wall. And that's the wall that it's referred to in the lyrics. Anyway, um, I'm going to stop sharing now because of the time. But um, I think I pretty much covered what I wanted to say and, and show that once again, Iron Maiden um, drew inspiration from this uh, mythical, if you like, uh, figure of the Samurai in order to, to elaborate creatively on that. And some of it, it, it could be, uh, could be um confirmed with the historical uh, sources some of it was created but in any case uh that's it i mean they they focus on what would be interesting for the ethos of heavy metal which has to do with bravery which has to do if you like with death just uh, as larry was uh, commenting on the on the artwork that is the figure of of of, of death on the background, right? We, we, we can keep asking why, you know, but it has to do with, with all this ethos and this spirit of heavy metal. Well, uh, so I, I pass once again to Larry. She's going to explain how we're going to, to do it from now. Thank you.